Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we are looking at Golisopod Garbodor, a very powerful archetype that came second at Worlds initially when uh, Golisopod was first released, and it's pretty much continued to be in and around the top tiers uh, since then. Um, there's been a few hiccups here and there, it's had a few um, inconsistency issues, and that's one of the reasons why the deck hasn't been seeing too much play since the release of Zoroark. More people are choosing to do, use different partners with Golisopod, but this variant is still powerful. Um, the Trash Launch Garbodor is still a very strong card, especially with the amount of Buzzwall roaming around. Ability Lock still fantastic uh, in the format with lots of ability-focused decks still, again, also very prevalent. So the archetype is still very strong. It still has the age-old things that it's trying to do, bounce with a Cirola, Guzma up things to keep using the one energy attacking Golisopod as often as possible. And uh, I still believe it's, you know, at least a tier 2 archetype, if not even higher, based on the metagame. So it's definitely one to keep an eye on. And today we'll be going through the list. So first of all, we have a 3-3 count of Golisopod. The Wimpod's actually a great lead for you, uh, because on your first turn, this Pokemon has no retreat cost. So you can quite easily um, move out of your Wimpods to protect them. That means that you basically have the Coco and for Wimpod as ideal leads. Especially if you can bridge it, it means that you can then Wimp out into your Tapu Coco, which really helps you set up for the following turn. Even if we can't move into Tapu Coco, we play such a high count of Floatstone anyway that promoting anything but the Wimpod is a great way to protect it on turn one, so that then hopefully we can evolve on turn two into our big chunky Golisopod. Its attack is pretty irrelevant, but do bear in mind it has a three retreat cost, so it is searchable via Heavy Ball, which is nice. Then we have the Stage 1 Glycopod GX, three copies of this guy, 210 hit point, uh, Stage 1 is pretty nice. It also has the three retreat cost, so that's good again for Heavy Ball, you can see already how important that card is for the deck. It does have Weakness to Fire, which is a bit of an issue, uh, there are some Kiawe based decks right now, and that's something that this deck does struggle with. Um, but his attacks are all fantastic. First impression for a single Grass Energy does 30 base, and if this Pokemon was on the bench and became your active Pokemon this turn, you deal 90 more damage. So you can see the synergy with Wimpod. If you can Wimp out on turn 1, evolve on turn 2, then get back into the active, first impression is going to be pressurizing the opponent very, very quickly, which is awesome. He also has two other attacks. If you slap a DC on top of this guy, you can then access Armor Press, which does 100 base, and during your opponent's next turn, this Pokemon takes 20 less damage from attacks. Uh, this is very good for you as well. Uh, there's a few Pokemon that aim to hit 220 or 210, and you can get out of range. Things like the um, Duskmane Necrozma, which has just come out of Ultra Prism, as well as, of course, Bulu with Choice Band gets there. And they're always trying to hit 210. It is a magical number right now, but the Armor Press can oftentimes push you out of one hit hero range which is absolutely amazing for this deck. So Armor Press is a very good attack. And it also eases the reliance on Acerola and Guzmaring every single turn because we can just slap the DC on and continue to go for two shots uh, after using a first impression. So Armor Press, definitely a great attack in this deck. And the Crossing Cut GX attack is also very good. Grass DC does 150 base. 180 with Choice Band is obviously great for dealing with a basic EX and GX Pokemon. And you get to switch this Pokemon with one of your bench. So oftentimes you're going to try and throw a single prize Pokemon into the active position for the opponent to deal with. So that you're taking prizes, but the opponent's in a weird spot where they can't really end you because they need to Guzma away uh, the thing that you've thrown into the active position. So it, again, protects your Golisopod and forces your opponent to not play N against you. And one of the biggest issues of some Garbodor decks is when you take prizes, oftentimes you can lose by getting hit with an N. Well, the crossing cut is a natural way of getting around that because the opponent typically has to use other supporters that turn to try and deal with um, the crossing cut because you've moved your glyce pod to the bench. So uh, a very, very good GX attack that can help take one hit KOs in a mostly two hit KO deck. Um, and that's a big deal for you. So really good GX attack there. One copy of Tapu Koko. Flying Flip can do some nice math fixing. We are playing DCEs in here, so that's always an optional. Uh, an option, but mostly it's just your free retreat pivot. Um, Goosmering into this guy, then getting straight back is fantastic. It means that typically we need less cards to hit combo pieces, and that's a really good deal. And it's something that you can wimp out straight into that's a little bit less fragile than the 70 HP wimp pods and trubbishes, so he can sometimes tank hits more reliably, which is cool. From there, we are playing uh, three trubbish, the acid sprayer, because we are playing rainbow energies. Um, two Garbatoxin Garbodors. Um, obviously trying to lock down 
Zoroark, Magnazone, uh, Vika Vault, uh, Octillaries, Lycanrocks, all sorts of things right now. And Ability Locks just fantastic, still in the format. They are rife right now. And then we are playing one copy of Trash Lunch Garbodor. I'm kind of tempted to go as high as a 4-2-2 count of Garb because of the amount of Buzzwell right now. Because Trash Lunch is absolutely insane against Buzz, naturally. Um, you do 20 for each item in your opponent's discard pile. The Buzzwell lists are playing elixirs, so they naturally rack it up on their own. And of course, it's basically times 40 for each item they play if you're hitting into Buzzwells. So that can be excellent for you. Right now, I'm sticking with one copy plus Rescue Stretcher because we do have good access to this card, even though it is just a one copy because once again, we're playing two heavy balls. So finding him shouldn't be a huge issue. And well, as long as he's not prized. And Trash Lanch is... Not only good for Buzz, it's good in general as a fantastic late game sweeper if the opponent has had to play too many item cards. And this deck is quite good at taking games into longer stages because you're trying to undo damage with things like Acerella throughout the game. And typically that will strain the opponent's resources and force them to play item cards. So Trash Launch is something that the opponent is constantly aware of. Constantly, they're not thinning as much as they could do. They're not playing as many cards as they would like to. Because they're in fear of Trash Launch, even if there's just a Trubbish sat on your bench, they know at any time it could turn into this big guy. And it's a sort of hidden ability that this guy has that the opponent has to play very differently around him just because they know it's in the deck. Um, so even if you're not doing big Trash Launch knockouts, sometimes the value is hidden throughout the game because you're going to end the opponent to one and instead of them drawing into good cards, they've drawn into item cards that they chose not to play earlier in the game because they're worried about Trash Launch. So it really puts the opponent in a lose-lose situation, and that's why Trash Launch is still a fantastic card. Onto the items, we are playing one copy of Field Blower. I'm just a little bit scared of parallels and how much they are around in the format right now. It can be a little bit annoying. It's always important for you to develop uh, one Glycopod and at least one Wimpod on your bench as well, if not two fully charged Glycopods, uh, so that you can do your Acerola plays. It's also important to, again, try and threaten multiple Trubbish, so... I like the Field Blower to mainly gust away uh, Parallels and other stadiums in general, but it's also good for racking up, once again, the Trash Launch count, so I believe it's worth the one slot. Uh, one copy of Rescue Stretcher trying to recycle our Pokemon. Going to be nice to recycle um, Garbodor, especially in things like Buzzwell matchups, and just in general picking up the things that we need to throughout the game. One copy of Palpad, a new addition from Ultra Prism. One of the reasons why this deck is a little bit more consistent than previously. You're able to shuffle two supporter cards from your discard pile into your deck. I'm basically choosing to play this over just the straight fourth copy of Guzma. Because in certain matchups it will be, you know, your fourth and fifth Guzmas. Or extra, uh, extra Ace of Rollers in matchups like uh, Zoropod. Where they're also trying to undo damage. Now you have more ways of bouncing than your opponent does, so in theory you should be able to negate damage more effectively. Uh, and it also means that if it's in a late game situation and you're starting to take prizes, you can power pad back in just like a couple of Sycamores if that's going to help you out defend against N. So I think thanks to the additions of Cynthia and Palpad, the deck is much more consistent than previously, and that's why we're revisiting it here in the new format. Two copies of Heavy Ball. Great for Glycopod, Wimpod, and both your Garbodors. So uh, really, really a very clutch card. It's one of the reasons why we get away with just one copy of Bridget, because we can still get access to Wimpods very effectively if we're just going to use Shuffle, Draw, or Discard, Draw, and we'll still likely hit a number of Wimpods and Heavy Balls to still set up quite effectively if we miss that turn one Bridget. Uh, I forgot to say that we are still playing Lele's, actually. Energy Drive's a really good attack, and we have Tapicure available as... Uh, as an option because we're playing rainbows but it's mainly in here for one tag as you all know here are the four ultra balls which help grab the lele in the early turns so that we can use bridget um because that's still going to be important to get again multiple wind pods sometimes your coco sometimes trubbishes if it's an important matchup and uh yeah that's going to help you get going as i said i feel like we only need one copy because you're going to fish it out with lele most often and it's just a dead draw for the rest of the game. So we don't need to play multiple, especially when we have the backup of Heavy Ball to search out Wimpods, which are the most important thing to find on turn one. From there, we are playing the three copies of Ace of Roller. Obviously great when we're tanking with Glycopod. We'll just pick it all up, play it all back down on the bench, move back into the active and swing with the first impression. It's what we see with Zoropod and uh, Glyspod is equally as effective at doing it in this deck as well. Three copies of Guzma, uh, making sure we can hit the right targets, and also moves your Glyzopod back to the bench so you can move back to the active for first impression, so amazing synergies there. 
Three copies of Cynthia, some additional shuffle draw is always nice to have in Garbodor decks because we don't inherently have our own draw mechanic. So drawing into as many supporters as possible is nice. We're playing a 10 count of draw supporters and power pad on top of that, so it should be decent for consistency. A lot more decent than the 8 count that we used to play with just the 4-4 splitter then in Sycamore. So uh, we get a little buff with Cynthia and that's always nice. Three copies of N. We're going to try and disrupt the opponent if they're going ahead. And N plus Garb is still one of the most disruptive things you can do in the format right now. Um, and yeah, still playing three copies. I'm choosing to play four Sycamore instead of four N. Even though this is sometimes a defensive deck, I think more often than not, because we're concerned about how few cards we'll draw off our own back with N, that I'd rather still have some power draw. And that's why we're going for the four copies of Sycamore. You can debate flip-flopping Sycamore and Cynthia counts. I have done that. Uh, but I think with Power Pad especially, one of the biggest issues of Sycamore was getting rid of too many supporter cards. But now we have Power Pad, which can slightly mitigate that factor. And in general, it's still really important to thin as much as possible when you're playing your own Garbodor deck because any jank can be a problem for you in the late game situations when you're getting hit with an N. So having as many Sycamores as possible will be the best way to mitigate that naturally. From there, we're playing uh, Seven Tools. Three of them are going to be choice bands, great for improving the maths on crossing cuts. It also means that first impression can do 150 and then against things like Zoroark and Glycopod, other 210 HP stage ones, you can just hit again in the active for 60 and that still gets you to 210. So that means you don't have the pressure of hitting Acerola's, Guzma's uh, or DCE. You can still just do a two shot naturally with choice band. It also pushes, once again, Trash Alliance into amazing numbers. It means Acid Spray can even take one hits against Buzzwells in the early game. Uh, and that's also incredible. And from there, we're just going to play four floats. Amazing on your Garbodor, naturally, so it doesn't get stuck. But also great on your Glycopods as well, so they don't get stuck. You can just retreat after you've done a first impression. And um, then attack with maybe a Lele or a second Glycopod, for example. So that's all good. Floatstone, a fantastic card. From there, we're playing 11 energy total, four of them DCE, great for Lele, Coco, and Galisopod. Also does allow Acid Spray to be an option. Then we have the four rainbows, obviously mostly important for Trash Alanche, but also uh, viable on Galisopod GX. And finally, three copies of Grass Energy, which just go on Galisopod for the most part, unless you're trying to improve maths with energy drives and stuff like that. So there you go, that is going to be the list. There's a couple cards you can consider playing. Uh, Tapu Fini is one of them uh, that was in some previous um, Galisopod Garbador lists. If you're anticipating a lot of Kiawe builds, I definitely encourage playing this card uh, because you can Tapu Storm away their initial Kiawe target and that really sets them back a long way. Additionally, it's a water type Pokemon that can hit 100 with a choice band on things like Turtonators and Volcanian EXs and it also moves itself to the bench. Um, which can again force the opponent to hit Guzmas alongside like elixirs and other attachments and stuff like that. So it could be a nice card against the Kiawe variants if you need it to be, and that's something to be aware of. Tapu Storm in general is just a good GX attack for the deck. Overall, I just love crossing cut so much that I'm not playing Feeny, but you can definitely consider playing it. Another card you can consider, I know Mace played this in his Malmo list. I think he got top 16 in Malmo. Um, and that's Taurus GX. Taurus is a 180 hit point Pokemon, and there's a lot of 2 hit KO decks out in the format right now, most of them, namely Zoroark decks. And they can sometimes find it hard to deal with your Tauros, because you're going to go for early Bridgets, find Tauros, slap DC on, and start using Horn Attack. Horn Attack can deal with Zoruas in the early turns, which is great for you. It's also even Heavy Ball searchable, so it's a real easy find in the early game. So you can start pressurizing with Horn Attack, whereas otherwise you were just attached to a Wimpod and pass. Now you can just start swinging with Tauros instead and start taking prize cards and taking Zeruas off their board. And that's always a high priority. And the opponent basically have to Guzma around the Tauros or like E-Hammer and do other shenanigans and not hit it. Because if they do hit into it, then a Mad Bull becomes a crazy powerful GX attack. So... It's something the opponent has to play around. Oftentimes they can go for like an E-Hammer Energy Drive play, or they can do like a Choice Band Flying Flip play. All these things uh, are viable and do get around the Tauros quite effectively. But if they just put a chip amount of damage on your Tauros, there's nothing stopping you just Acer rollering it back up um, and then reutilizing him later on in the game. So I think he is a powerful card that you can use in this deck. 
One of the big downsides is that Buzzwalt is everywhere, and leading this against Buzzwalt can sometimes be an issue for you, especially if if it's the Buzz Rock variant, because they'll be able to scale up to 180 much quicker than the Buzz Garb variant. So do bear that in mind. Um, for item cards, I've mentioned Blower as a card, and from there, I think there's not much that I would really think about. I'm not going to play my own stadiums in here. I think one other card is Enhanced Hammer. That's been in some successful lists. I'm always of the opinion that trying to make Garb decks as greed-free as possible is the best way to play the deck, but E-Hammer is a powerful card right now. We're weak against it, but so are many other decks. Um, so squeezing in one or two may not be the worst uh, plan for you, just because it can slow down people, and again, alongside um, an N or something like that, you can really shut down things like Zoroark decks or help tempo out against some of the Buzzwell variants that are so reliant on strong energies. So these are all things to be aware of. E-Hammer is a strong card, but in general, I like to be as straightforward as possible with my lists, and that's always uh, my policy in the game. So that's why we're not doing it here. Let's jump into the ladder and see how this deck performs. Hopefully better than Buzzgarb. If you saw that from a couple of days ago, man, we had some pretty trash hands throughout that ser those uh, three series. So... Let's uh, see how this variant of Garbodor treats us. Uh, we do get to go first here, which is always nice for a deck that evolves. And uh, we have an opening Mull. Would have been a nice hand. And we have... Wow, what a great hand this is. This is absolutely insane. Leading Coco is amazing, and we already have Trubbish Wimpod. That's really, really strong for us. Really good start. And let's see what we're up against. I only see a Feeny. Uh, a Lele, I should say. Uh, we can attach to Wimpod quite happily. I think I'm just going to pass here. Hand is strong. I don't want to be over eager and Sycamore away. A Garbodor because it could be important to keep in the matchup if they're a Buzzwell variant. Looks like they're playing Crab Brawler. Now Crab Brawler has 140 hit points and that's hard to deal with for Golisopod. But we have Tapu Koko and that's really good. Uh, we're going to fire off an end here. I want to save Trash Lanch because he'll be a nice single prize Pokemon to attack with. We drew into another Wimpod which is nice. Don't need to put down Garbodor just yet because we don't have a tool anyway, so we'll just go for an early flying flip here. Set up those crab rulers for later on with Glycopod. That sounds good to me. So they have Floatstone for their active. Coco, of course, does have weakness against crab ruler, so they could easily deal with it if they wanted to this turn. They're going to put down a choice band and go for their Cynthia there as well. We should be able to ace a roller bounce once we find our Glycopods. Because Crab Roller are not great at taking one shots against us. Gutsy Hammer does 80 base. So even with the help of Choice Band Strong Energy, they won't get there. So we should be fine. They are just going to retreat their Crab Roller. Uh, sorry, retreat into Crabominable and uh, take the knockout on Coco. He's already done the thing that we needed him to do, so that's fine. Um. Because he's done 20 more to himself, I'm just going to promote this Wimpod. It means that we can draw into DCE as well as an out now, rather than needing like Floatstone on its own. I'm going to put the Garbodor into play because they're probably trying to go for Octidory at some point. I'm going to Sycamore, try and hit Golisopod. There is Golisopod. We only hit Floatstone. We didn't hit another Grass Energy, and we didn't hit DCE, so that's a problem. But we do still have a Cerola in the deck. Okay, let's grab this guy. I think we're just going to grab a Cerola proactively before we put down Garbatoxin. How bad is hitting this for 30? It's quite bad. That's for certain. But it protects our guy. It sets up base of roller. Do I need to ability lock here? I think it's better than not locking. 
I'm just considering whether I Ultra Ball to protect Wimpod here. Ultra Ball away, N, and Choice Band. Yeah, I like it. Choice Band not going to be too relevant until we deal with his Lele later on, and we still have two in the deck. So let's protect all of our targets. So no matter what, we can do it. We can fairly happily ace a roller. And we'll just hit him for 30. Bit of a shame that we didn't draw into DCE. Floatstone wasn't out as well. If we ran into Floatstone Rainbow or Floatstone Grass, it was a bit of a shame that we top decked Grass Energy and chose not to attach it, looking for the DCE line. But I still think we had more outs this way. It's just so happened that we got the other combination of cards. They're going to play their own Acer Roller and pass it over to us. And because we don't want to get rid of our own Acer Roller, we'll just hit this for 30. <laughs> A pretty weak turn, but their turn wasn't great either. It was an Acer Roller pass rather than Acer Roller attack. They're just going to Acer Roller again. Okay. Seems like there's a pattern emerging here. They're picking up their damaged Crabrawler. That makes sense. So now each of their Crabrawlers can tank hits. Okay, I understand. Still choosing not to attack us. Let's just go for first impression. I'm still valuing our Acer Roller more highly because we've already got rid of two we do have uh the pal pad but i still value the acer roller more looks like they're pretty much waiting until they have like a guzma or something like that well looks like they're happy to cynthia here refresh their hand And they're actually going in with Gutsy Hammer now. Rainbow Energy isn't DCE, which is a bit of a shame. We'll just uh, pick up Glycopod. Send in the new one. Bench the old one. Happy to attach a grass. And we'll just go for first impression. You have to assume that they did draw into an Acerola if they were choosing to attack us. Or a Max Potion. They may play both. They have Guzma. They're going for Garbodor instead of Wimpod, which I don't mind too much. They're just going to go for a Gutsy Hammer. Promote Lele here. We can just pay Retreat on a Rainbow. Gonna Cynthia over Sycamore because we preserve them a little bit better. Is it important for us to develop a Trubbish this turn? Not particularly. We've only played one item so far. <laughs> Let's just hit the crab. See if they've got a Cirola. Like, even if they do, they need, like, a Serona Max Potion, something like that. Just a Cynthia. And Crabrawler, or Crabominable, has a large retreat cost, so we may be forced into just going gutsy here. They're going to play Ultra Ball. Probably going to develop an Octillery now. Yep. And there is the Gutsy Hammer for 130, knocking themselves out, because of course Crabominable does damage to himself. And they're going to promote a Lele. That's going to let us take even more prizes, but we just topped Guzma. I was, think I was pretty content to just go for a Bridget turn here. Is dealing with this Crabrawler better? If they ace a Roller, that's absolutely fine. I think dealing with a Lele is right here. Also, Armor Press means that he needs to find Choice Band. I kind of like Bridget. Bridget sounds good. Okay. 
because this looks like a much better board state. I'm not going to cross in cut because that could be a great way to KO a Crabominable fresh. They're going to send in their Crabominable. Bit of a mouthful, that name. Well, Armor Press doesn't push us out, of course. They have strong energy, but they had Choice Band anyway. They're going to play some tools. Use a super odd, recycle some of their crabs, and they have an N. They do hit max potion. And strong. We did draw into DC though, so we can just crossing cut this guy. Take an ultra ball, they probably need to develop another. Um brawler and there is the gutsy hammer let's go Golisopod. time for a crossing cut turn there's another Golisopod. hmm I think just promoting Lele's right because we have our other rainbow in hand we do still have lots and lots of uh, float stones. There's no way that he can one shot the Lele, though. Okay. This feels pretty safe to me. There's a float, that's actually pretty big. Another Crabrawler comes down. Stretcher gets them Crabominable if they want it. And they're going to play N again. Back into Sycamore. Feels good, man. They get their first Abyssal handoff. They've got double artillery developed now. Pretty intimidating. Choice span to the bench. Max Potion. I think they're just trying to play as many cards as possible for their own Abyssal Hand. That's exactly what's happening. And Gutsy Hammer. Going to do a big chunk to us. Second Garbodor. We have to hope that they don't have Guzma. We don't have a tool either, so we can't actually ability lock them, so they're going to have a lot of chances to hit Guzma here. They, I mean, they need to have... No, it's only Guzma, because we can't kill Grabominable, because I need to pay retreat on this Lele. Not even a float stone, so I could attack with Trash. That would at least force Guzma Pokemon energy. No, it looks like we're going to lose to this Crab deck. Uh, that's unfortunate. That is very unfortunate, I think. Uh, well, maybe the time where I didn't Sycamore was too passive. I, pr I thought I was more ahead than I was, really. Hmm. Sadness. I'm going to drop the well played. I imagine he has a way into Guzma here. Still has lots of Ultra Balls. Probably one more Lele. Acerola is not Guzma, so we didn't lose. But he does reset the clock. That is good news for us, though. We did draw into Floatstone as well. Uh, 
Okay. We need to end them. Don't think we're going to need Guzma because he's not going to put down any more two prize Pokemon the whole game. So we'll get rid of these. We still have two floats, so moving should be fine. Going to do this. Going to play the N. Going to stick with armor press. Keep us out of range even if he has a strong energy. And if he wants to attack, he knocks himself out, so he probably can't attack. He hits energy Cynthia. Is that going to be enough, though? If he can't attack us this turn, it's probably... Well, it might still be enough, because he could have Guzma next turn. We were never able to find Power Pad for our Acer Rollers. So, we do lose to a Guzma here, once again. Do we need any of these cards? I mean, we can't thin any of them with Ultra Ball. Like, there's no deck, there's no card in the deck that we can thin again. Uh, so we just slap this here, I guess. And again, we can't be knocked out by the crab. It can only be a Guzma here. But they are likely to have it. There is the Guzma. Wow, losing to crabs feels bad, man. Uh, we got rid of Acerola's early, and it was punishing. Could never power pad them back. Couldn't field blow away their float stone, which would have made it more difficult as well. Well, it kind of it means that they didn't have they had to have the Guzma in hand, otherwise they lost. Huh? Sad times. We had those few really slow turns. It was me proactively leleing the Acer Rider that actually hurt us a lot. So I was unprepared to Sycamore it away. And it gave him a lot of turns to undo damage that we did with Coco. That was a really intriguing game. Inexperience against that deck, I guess. But who can blame me for that? Here's a much worse hand. <clears throat> Garbodor Mirror of sorts. Playing Psychic Energy, so it's probably Espion Garb. Trampa Espion Garb. They don't have much going for themselves either. If I attach DCE, we can die to a Lele. If I attach Rainbow... Can't get knocked out by Lele. But with so much salary against Hammers... Either way, we're sad against, like, Floatstone Dramper. But they would have played a basic Pokemon down if they had one. Um... Wait, if I put the Rainbow down, we still die to a Lele, what am I saying? So we'll hope that he can dead draw for an extra turn, then we can just Glycopod win. It's a risk that we could lose the game, but it's a risk I'm taking. They could DC Acid Spray. Oh, Beetle. <laughs> well, we can we can beat that with our hand anyway. Okay, two losses. Just Garbodor things. Sadness. So let's think about how many outs we have for turn one supporter. Ten physical draw supporters. Sycamores and Cynthia's. Then we play Lele's. And we also play Ultra Balls. And we also play Heavy Balls for more basic Pokemon on turn one as well. And we play a decent chunk of basics. 
quite unlucky. Well, we've got a concession. Let's try and get a third game in. If at all possible, that would be grand. Here we go. Fairy colorless. Sylveon? Quad Sylveon? Probably Quad Sylveon. Can be a tricky matchup. Yep, Quad Sylveon. You still put Trubbishes down in this matchup because um, Trash Lanch is definitely a big factor. Choice banding is somewhat of a trap. Somewhat of a trap because we want to be able to maneuver between our wind pods. We want to be jumping between glide pods every turn, right? So is choice band ever right? One goes on the trubbish, sure, that's fine. Does one go on one of our wind pods? Sure. I think it could be a problem though. We want to just bounce with floats, right? Hmm. In the first instance, it doesn't actually matter, so I will put it down. Bit of a shame we can't pressurize damage this turn. Need to hold. I guess I could stretch uh, exactly Lele back now and do an energy drive for 60. It does set up a first impression. Okay, I don't hate it. It also gets Wimpod out of the active, which is good. It does spend a stretcher, which is a little awkward, but it's damage, and that's good. Do I ever want to take a card so that we can Ultra Ball it away? Hmm. Maybe the Ace of Rollers are the deadest cards. Probably the Ace of Roller. So that we can Ultra Ball a Glycopod next turn. Let's hit him for 60. Force some heal cards. Because they haven't ribboned yet, of course, so there's a chance that they don't have it. There's a flare grunt. Any heal? No heal. We can win. We need to Cynthia into a float stone. Fun fact, they could have put the parallel the other way and not been in this situation. But oh well. Sounds like a misplay to me. Yeah, if they put the parallel the other way around, they'd be safe this turn. But we haven't... Well, now we have drawn into Floatstone.
It's a learning experience for Sylveon. Getting that little poke of 60 was a big deal. Do we have time for one more game? We have time for one more game before I have to start streaming. Okay. Come on then, Glycopod. We've had a donk against us in a garb mirror of sorts. Then we just donked a Sylveon. We had a concede against us and we had a long loss against a brawler of all things. Alrighty, we get to go first. And this isn't a great start. Sneasel. So Zoro Weavile. Drawing into an extra energy. Ugh, sad. Sad face emoji. Getting rid of two tools as well that aren't on Garbodor is really bad when you're up against a Zoroark deck. And that's a hand. They can go for a sneaky smash as well to get rid of this DCE. I was aware of it, but we still just attach to it anyway. Sneaky smash works anyway. Well, there's their DCE for sneaky smash. If they don't hit a basic, we can win. Well, they hit a basic. Sneaky Smash still doesn't seem right here, though. Because they lose a Sneasel in the process. We are spending a DC, but... I think it's worth. Especially because we'd be putting down two Wimpods, which both have abilities onto our board. And it means that a Choice Band could deal with us. Let's see if the opponent can bridge it this turn. Put down a Mew. Play an N. N isn't Bridget. That's a fact. Oh wow. They're playing all sorts in here. Spending a field blur on something that isn't garbled or is good for us. Did they just draw nothing? Oh, they have Ultra Ball. They can evolve into a Zorak if they really want to. Getting rid of a fighting memory. There's Zoroark. And they're going to trade their only card left in hand. Single puzzle. They hit as a real, which is actually really nice for them. But it's over to us now. I'm going to commit both tools because, again, 40 isn't good numbers, but 70 is. So we'll do those two things and we'll play the Cynthia. I think I'm happy to hold the field blower. One target is still value, but. I think it's still better this way. Pal padding now seems fine. Just go Guzma, Cynthia. Pal pad's one of these cards that's really weird to sequence. Sometimes you want to hold it for a long period of time. Sometimes you want to play it as soon as you see it. Field blur in the two card hand. <laughs> Feels good. If this is a, a supporter, I'm going to be upset. Oh my god. <laughs> the combo. That is broken. That is broken. Wow. 
Oh man. Uh, this game. I love Pokemon. <laughs> Okay. Okay, then. Stuff's happening. Two trades coming in. Do they have DC to boot? Four of our tools are already gone. So we will have to be careful with them. I'm just thinking the next turn we need a choice band to finish off this Zoroark. So that's a bit of a shame. No DCE. Just a dark to their Silv Ally. That is good for us. Can confirm that that is good for us. I'm always of the opinion that keeping as many supporters in hand as possible is good. I mean, deck as possible is good, but I also think that developing cards is good here. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Trash is already getting pretty big, so let's try and develop some trubs. That's nice. That's nice. Energy drive. So an Acerella is fairly likely with their hand size as big as it is. But they didn't have DC last turn, and to be good, they need to have Acerella DC. Well, they have Dark Energy Multi Switch. They can copy tricks to G. They can tricks the GX and crossing cut our Lele here. Which is very cheeky of them. They're also going to get a mallow done. Two field blowers already gone, so I'm not sure what they're mallowing to the top. <clears throat> be interesting to see. Regardless, we'll be ending them if they do go for a trickster turn here. Yep, they're going to copy crossing cut. I imagine they're copying crossing cut. Yep, there is Crossing Cut GX. They go into their own Lele. I'm going to fire off the field blower now, just because I'm going to be ending myself to five, and I'd rather not draw into that. We don't need to choice man this turn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we're not going to play choice band. Still have to be aware of them field blowing away garb or tool. We do get garb, that's nice. Trash looks pretty good here. So we'll go for it. Take two prizes. They don't currently have knockout on board. And when a Zoroark deck's being entered for with two blowers already gone, it may actually be tricky for them to write a speeding respond this. They're at 80. They need two more basic Pokemon.
Mallow probably won't cut it unless they randomly play. Well, they could play three blower, I guess. By the looks of things, Garbodor's going to be doing good stuff here. Second Mallow. Two Mallow in his alright deck that's not even a stage two deck. That's pretty interesting. Unprepared for Garb. We'll happily take advantage of that. Let's try and thin as many cards as possible. Heavy Ball is a useless card. I could have gone for an Acerella play, uh, play to protect Garb, but I thought it was more important to try and draw into a Guzma for next turn to finish off the Mew for game. We didn't draw into any Guzmas, but we can develop another Trubbish at least. And we'll just go for Trash. Feels like this one Garbador taking four prizes should be enough to finish off the job. Even with their Mallow. Might be a puzzle turn if they've used Mallow. No, they've hard run three field blower. Kapow. So they're not very... Well, they're greedy in the fact that they play two Mallow, but they're not greedy in the fact that they play three blower. So it all, all evens out in the end. It's so their one and only trade. They haven't hit any DCs yet all game. Oh, they've hit one, sorry. Let's see where that gets them into Ultra Ball. Getting rid of two Zoroarks. That's a sad sight. They're going to have to go for Lele here. Lele probably ending me. Well, do they even end me? Because they need to hit DC. That's something that needs to happen. So maybe they just accept, if I have Guzma, I have game. Maybe they just, just say, you know what, I need DCE to deal with this garb right now. Well, they're not even searching a Lele out. So have they prized two? Oh, they have hard N. Okay, so they're hoping to hit DC off this. <laughs> we pulled Guzma anyway. So the outcome doesn't matter now. Three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve. Okay, it's it's fine if they. Well, it's not fine, but it's not good for them if they miss, right? Parallel reducing my uh, grass type damage is intelligent, but we do have the GX attack still available. They did hit DCE. Feels good. But there it is. Crossing cut, even with the reduction, was enough to win the game. So we got a handful of games there. Um, strange loss against Crabrawler. I'm going to have to look at that back. I, I know there must have been errors there. I know we were just like prodding for 30 for a few turns because of my weird Acerola play. And there was another turn where I didn't play Sycamore. So I probably made a lot of errors against Crab just because... They're crabs, and I took it too lightly. But, yeah. Uh, against the other stuff, we did okay. We got donked against uh, another Garb deck. Uh, we don't have high odds of getting donked, looking at the amount of basics that we play, the amount of ball search, and the amount of supporters that we play. Everything points to us not getting donked, and yet we still did. So, that's just how it goes sometimes. But we were able to beat a Zoroark variant. It looked like an interesting one, playing Sylvalli and Weavile, but still uh, pretty interesting. And uh, we were able to KO a, Sil a, a Sylveon turn two as well, thanks to a cheeky 
energy drive. So that is going to be the deck, guys. Let me know what you think about the list and uh, the archetype itself. Always happy to answer comments down below. Please leave a like to the video if you did. Subscribe if you haven't already. For now, though, it has been Joe from Omnipoke, and I'll be seeing you guys next time. Cheers.